in my presentation, I will focus on the relation between art and architecture, and two, you can say, repressed chapters uh, in the history of uh, Warsaw architecture. I mean, uh, by which I mean uh, the whole bunch of plasticism, and like mosaics and paintings inside uh, public use buildings from the communist time and socialist time, uh, and uh, the activity of uh, Jerzy Sotan, uh, the architect who was uh, really well connected with the modernist movement. He was working very closely with Le Corbusier after the Second War, and then he moved to back to Warsaw to build, uh, to rebuild the city and to introduce uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, connecting uh, architects and artists uh, in very deep way uh, of constructing uh, well-designed public spaces which could also enable people to interact uh, with themselves. And both of, these, um, both of these chapters, they stand in very, yeah, they are repressed. Like the mosaics are currently <coughs> demolished and they are like removed uh, because they are, uh, most of them are placed in public, uh, public buildings which are currently under renovation. And uh, usually they, the aesthetic of those uh, of, the, of those um, uh, works is not very fitting the aesthetic of neoliberal architecture, which prefer glass and uh, glass and steel, and um, yeah, so they are like simply just removing this uh, these works without thinking about it. So my organization was uh, taking part uh, actively uh, in this movement of, um, of uh, creating this uh, um, mosaic, mosaic issue as a problem and showing, uh, showing them in the city that they exist and that they are part of uh, actual Mm, very, very elaborated politics like state government politics of introducing art into, uh, into the city life and uh, urban design. And uh, that maybe um, uh, this is something which we should reconsider right now uh, and use it as a real example how to think about the city and uh, how to think about the public spaces, to make them real public and uh, to make them look like public spaces, not like banks or uh, shopping malls, which is right now currently happening uh, in Poland. So we published this uh, uh, Archimapa, uh, which is uh, a map of, uh, of Warsaw mosaics. Uh, this is like bilingual uh, publication, Polish and English. It's based uh, on the research of Warsaw art historian Paweł Giergoń, uh, who was researching this subject for many, many, many years. And uh, this is a result. I actually brought these p publications here to here with me. So in the, during the break, maybe you can see, see it. Uh, then the map was expanded into whole book, Warsaw Mosaics, which is also here, <coughs> where you, ca you can see the documentation of those, uh, uh, of those works. <coughs> Some of them already disappeared. Uh, Others are restored and kept in their, or, uh, in their original site, on the or original site, or maybe moved a bit. And then you have also a third publication about this subject, uh, which was uh, published by Klara Czerniewska, who is a young art, hist uh, art historian from Warsaw. 
and uh, she was focusing on uh, the oeuvre of uh, um, artistic couple, uh, Gabriela and uh, Herman Rehovich, who were uh, involved into uh, a lot of public realizations uh, in many iconic modernistic buildings uh, uh, as well. So I would like to start my uh, presentation with, pa uh, with Platz Constituzzi in Warsaw, which is one of the central squares uh, in the city of Warsaw right now. It was designed during the Stalinist era as main po point of new uh, socialistic uh, city. As you can see at the picture, it's like you can see it in many, <laughs> many places. From the uh, first point of view, it's quite boring and like gray space. But uh, in fact, it's full of uh, architecture details and also uh, artist, artist works. Uh, and you can really see that from the, from the very beginning, artists were actively involved into creation of new, new spaces uh, within the city, uh, designing those mosaics which are representing workers and the revolution and the changing of the system, economically and political system, uh, within the country. So, here is a few examples of those figurative mosaics, which you can see right now. Um, and uh, it's actually quite interesting case studies, because from one hand, they represent the past, which Polish citizens, they are not very happy about it happening. But from the uh, other hand, because those mosaics are figurative and they are easy to understand, and they use uh, aesthetic which is easy to you know, follow, they are easier to actually preserve than the other mosaics I will show you, uh, which were created in the 60s and 70s, which were more abstract and more formal in their uh, in their uh, in their view, so right now people cannot really understand them. So it's much easier to destroy them and just remove because it's just like you know they are not renovated for many many years, so it, they are in a very bad bad shapes currently. So removing them with uh, new design seems to be important and good thing to do, but maybe not, not really. So here I present a uh, few uh, examples uh, of, uh, of uh, what, you can, what you can see. Um, these, are, uh, these are mosaics and uh, abstract, uh, uh, abstract compositions which were usually, uh, usually uh, implemented in the public buildings, like libraries, uh, like, um, like um, uh, post offices, train stations, and so on and so on. All those buildings which are right now uh, under reconstruction and uh, um, the strategy which is implemented by the city right now and this Polish railway uh, company, for example, is just simply to destroy everything and just build new structures uh, with, the, uh, with the private capital. So right now train stations, for example, in Poland start to look more like shopping malls than the train station actual, and post offices as well stopped being post offices but are more like shopping centers with this added, added function of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of post office. Um, 
here is also one example I wanted to focus. It's a, it's a children's memorial health in institute, a huge investition from the, from the state from the 70s, uh, which was the designed uh, as a memorial for children which uh, were suffering from the Second World War. Um, this was like international uh, investition. A lot of gifts were given to this uh, uh, to this uh, hospital, like the equipment. This was like from all over the world, donations to 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 uh, to uh, make it real and make it working. And uh, it has also like really really elaborated program of uh, uh, of. Um, uh, of the decorations made made by artists. Uh, what is uh, interesting is that this shift, where in the 50s you have uh, had figurative uh, compositions, and then during the time it was getting more and more and more abstract, and at some point more uh, uh, more um, uh, how, how do you say? Um, conceptual, I would say, uh, which was at one hand the result of the expansion of uh, artistic research, but from the other hand, it was like simply the real life who was entering uh, uh, and uh, interrupting artistic process. Like the, uh, the socialist economy was not working very well, so they were forced uh, to not to use traditional materials for mosaics by to search for for different for different uh, materials so actually with this uh, with this hospital and with this center you can see that this part it's a huge mosaic and it's made from the waste from the local factory of ovens um, at the beginning, there was like a classical mosaic design for this, for this, uh, for the building, to be the most like p uh, one of the most prominent building at that time. But uh, because of the economical struggle, uh, they have to change the the, the idea and the uh, walls uh, uh, to use different materials to uh, to 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 decorate uh, the walls. So this also brings uh, another issue and problem with uh, conservation and preservation of those uh, of those uh, traces of artist presence in the within the city, because waste from the factory of ovens it's not really easy to uh, you know there is no ways of conservating uh, this kind of uh, this kind of materials so. This is why uh, uh, it's also so easy to remove them just, uh, just like that. And here you see uh, another example of late uh, mosaics and late uh, um, decoration from the National Library, uh, library in, uh, in Warsaw. And this is another example of recycled mosaic because uh, if you if we could get closer to the to this wall we could actually see that the mosaic is made of like waste glass and also waste uh, metal objects also from local factory <coughs> this is another abstract mosaic which is a uh, decoration of uh, of Wa Warsaw uh, train uh, Warsaw metro system well, the very first, uh, the very first metro station were also designed in the re, uh, uh, together with architects uh, and uh, and artists working together. And uh, here are here I prepared small presentation of uh, Gabriel uh, Rehovich uh, uh, work. So you can actually see that this is a design which is still somehow attractive uh, and fitting our uh, our what we think that is beautiful beautiful right now 
but uh, together with uh, renovation of all those uh, public buildings, this whole uh, this whole works are just simply simply destroyed. So here another just like you know review of those of those places. This is, for example, train station in Gdańsk, in the north of Poland, where you have this mosaic which is representing trains and the transport transport system. Here, abstract composition about the sea and what's the life uh, in the sea. Another abstract, uh, uh, another composition from this train station, uh, which is representing uh, the uh, industry. And also, uh, I would like to tell you about the mosaics in Lublin, which were created um, in relation to a housing district designed by Oskar Hansen, uh, which is one of the most progressive architects from the 60s and 70s, who was uh, investigating this issue of creating linear, linear cities which are not based on this concentric uh, idea of the city, but may made linear. Uh, and he realized this idea within this, uh, this uh, housing district uh, in Lublin, which looks like that. But for him, it was also very important to uh, invite uh, artists to create this whole plastic program for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the district. Uh, because, from one hand, because of the aesthetic, to make things like nicer and uh, uh, and cozier, but from the other hand, this plastic program had uh, much more to to think, and this was like very important part of navigation system through the those blockhouses, which usually look uh, the same, and it's very easy to get lost. So they decided to design this uh, the decoration very, uh, you know, very. W w they were like very conscious on choosing the colors and so on and so on to make it easier uh, to people to navigate uh, around uh, around the city. So here is few examples of how it looks right now. It's devastated and. And another example of public space with uh, with uh, with mosaics. This is a train station. Another in Szczecin. And another example of of Szczecin. And here is Yuri Gagarin from Zielona Góra from the 50s when there was this uh, from the 60s uh, when there was this whole uh, ideology about expanding to cosmic cosmic space. So those mosaics, uh, it's just one of the examples I wanted to show you how artists can be present in a public space. And I think it's very important to be aware of their existence and be aware of their value uh, as a symbol of past time, but also as a value of, you know, being uh, aware of uh, importance of artist presence within the city. But I wanted to focus right now on the research I'm doing on Jerzy Sultan, uh, who was uh, implementing slightly different attitude to uh, the issue of connection between art and architecture. So Jerzy Sotan is very important for the history of Polish architecture, but at the moment he's very absent at the history of it. He was uh, a visionary who was, um, uh, who was um, working together with Le Corbusier, exp uh, exploring and expanding the modular system. So uh, uh, when he was <coughs> He was in the concentration camp. He wrote a letter to Le Corbusier when he read his book, uh, When the Cathedral Were White. Uh, 
and he was very uh, impressed and uh, uh, he just wanted to express his grateful to Le Corbusier. Then he invited him to his, uh, to his workshop in Paris. Uh, but after the war, he decided to come back to Poland to take part in the huge project of rebuilding the city uh, of Warsaw, which was completely destroyed. Uh, um, and needed a huge, uh, huge uh, uh, renovation. Uh, Sotan can, came back uh, full of idea, modernistic ideas, uh, but he faced the hardest time for artists ever. I mean, the Stalinist uh, era when modernism was not very welcome. So he was. Um, uh, he decided to create a small workshop at the Fine Art Academy in Warsaw, when he, uh, the, the workshop of artistic research, uh, this was the name uh, of this institution, where he invited artists, architects and designers, city planners and also uh, specialists from very, very different, uh, from very different backgrounds to work together on, uh, on uh, architecture design and uh, urban planning. They created a lot of uh, projects, very elaborated, very, you know, uh, thinking very, uh, think through, like very deep, uh, connected with very, very deep research. Few of them were realized and you can still see them uh, in, the, in, the city, in the city space uh, of Warsaw. One of them is this train station, uh, which is uh, Warszawa Śródmieście train station, uh, so the central station for, for sub-urban uh, system of trains, next to the Palace of Culture and Science, so the Stalinist building in the mid right in the middle of the city. So Sontan and his team were invited to design the, the interior of this station. And at many levels, this, uh, this, the, this design was very influential and important for the rest of trace, train, stations, uh, uh, train stations in Poland. Uh, this project was prepared by Sotan as an architect, but he was also working with Wojciech Fangor, who is a very famous Polish uh, painter, and a bunch of specialists on different, uh, on different fields. And this is the result, what they, what they did. And what they were focusing on, it was how the train station was, uh, uh, how the light is working within, within the, st the train station, because uh, this was like very, very, with very low ceiling. So the problem was that there was a huge uh, difference between the outside world, where you had like uh, sunlight and very bright places, and the inside, where it was like very dark, and you had this experience of being inside the pavement. So they elaborated the system for ceiling of those <coughs> wooden elements who at one point taking uh, important part inside uh, uh, putting the light uh, into the train station, but from the other hand they have also very important uh, meaning from the, for the acoustic uh, of the uh, of this station. So it's, uh, when the train is arriving, the acoustic is so good that you can actually still speak with people, with the person who is standing next to you, and it's not, you know, very, very, uh, because of that, it's not very, very, uh, uh, very loud. <coughs> in terms of light inside the station, they were also thinking about the motion of trains arriving to the station, so they decided to design this light system at the, uh, at the ed edges of the platforms. And this was like fully automatic system. When the train was arriving, those li lights were getting on. So at some point they were pointing this moment, so people were aware that they should keep out from the edge of the train station. But from the other hand, it was the light was 
making more visible the spectacle of a train who is arriving and the spectacle of different colors and shapes which were like changing during, during this movement. And speaking about trains arriving to, uh, to the train station, though this team was also thinking about what can actually people see when they arrive at the station within the train. So if you see right, right here, those columns are painted on white and black, and they are quite wild. This is why they were, they, what they were, what they tried to, and they are located pretty close to the edge of the platform. This is because they were thinking about what people can see, and they were trying also to design what people can see when they look outside uh, from the train arriving to the station. And when you can, we have to imagine it because we cannot go there and see it, but. If the train is arriving, this, uh, you can actually, pro probably you, you know it, the, what you can see outside is like blaring and the colors start to like go one after, after another. So they wanted, uh, they wanted people to see just white space with black, uh, with black, part, uh, black part on the, on the top of it. This is how the train station looks, uh, looks uh, right now. Uh, and the design of this train station, because of its modernity and because of all this background behind it, became, uh, became extremely popular among the citizens uh, and people who lived in Warsaw at that time. So it was so popular that they decided to organize New Year's Eve party in 1963 at this station. And here you can see there is a documentation that there was actual party there on the train station and people were dancing at the platforms. Here you can see also the design of these uh, of telephones. Um, and it's also very important about the typography. They were also thinking about the typography and the whole visual system of guiding people through the station. And this system was so good that the Polish railways they decided to implement it uh, into every train station all over the country. And the same thing applied to the benches they designed for this, uh, for this, uh, this station. They were like so well designed and so easy to, uh, so, so easy to use to clean and you know, uh, very, uh, very cheap in production. So they were implemented into the, into the train stations all over the country. You have also at this station a uh, whole program of uh, plastic interve interventions. This was designed by, uh, by Fangor as well. So here you have a few of those uh, mosaics, which you can see them. And again, this is not only a decoration of the system, but this has like a very practical, practical reason, uh, which uh, was to make easier for people to navigate around the station. And different colors of mosaics are representing different directions uh, uh, from, uh, yeah, from the, for the entrances and from the direction of the trains who are uh, arriving, uh, arriving to the station, and and also for this design, uh, Sultan was studying uh, how they are, the, how those mosaics are perceived during the arrival uh, of the train in the, to the station, and how they are perceived uh, by the person who is moving from one edge of the platform to another edge of the platform. And the, they, were like, they were thinking about this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, issues, uh, as well as they were thinking about the sound system for, for the station. At that time, the normal solution would be just to put one huge loudspeaker who would scream and say that the train is arriving, keep away from the edge of the, tr of, the, of, the, uh, of the platform. But Sotam and his team, they were so focused on make it, making this uh, being on the train station pleasant, 
that they decided to do something which is obvious right now, but that time was very progressive, not to make one loudspeaker announcing the arrival of trains, but to make whole system of small uh, loudspeakers who, will, who, can, uh, who can be uh, much more quiet, and it's much more uh, like pleasant to hear this kind of uh, uh, announcement. Also, it's very important to mention that the, at the train station they uh, implemented the system of three platforms, two platforms uh, at the back sides and one platform at the, at the bottom of the train station. And this was made to separate the, uh, the arrivals and departures. So the middle platform was just for, depart for, depar for, for the arrival people. When train was stopping at the train station, at first they were opening just left doors so people could leave the train and then they would close the doors at the left and open the doors at the right side so people could actually enter the station without interrupting with, uh, with those who were uh, in the train previously. Um, so you can see that they were thinking in many, many, uh, uh, many le on many, many levels about how to design good public space which is useful and which is nice looking and which is available from also artistic point of view. Here a few details from the station. Oh yeah, of course. And they also designed this system of presentation of, uh, um, of um, posters, which is still operating and it's still uh, very in good shape and working very well. So you have those boards which have this shape, like curved shape, so the person who is uh, standing in front of it can actually also easily see what's on, the, uh, on this uh, level, higher level, and actually it can also see what is on the lower level. Yeah, okay. So train station, uh, this train station in, is one of the examples of what they designed and how they were designing. And the second, uh, the second realization is uh, sports center Warszawianka in Mokotów district uh, in Warsaw, which was designed in 1960s as, as well. Uh, this was another very important project for, uh, for uh, that time, very, you know, <coughs> important from political reasons as well. There was a competition and uh, two winners were chosen during this competition. One project was social realistic, who was like historical architecture, and the second one was the design proposed by Sultan and his, and, and his team. And uh, because of the political changes uh, in Poland, they uh, decided to put into implementation this very modern, uh, uh, modern design of, uh, of Jerzy Sultan team. So this sports center is located close to the river, and there is a, the only one hill in Warsaw. It's next to the next to the river. And preparing this design, the architects were actually thinking not about separate buildings, but about the whole landscape, and about what people will see when they are inside those buildings and when they use the sport facilities which meant to be designed. So here you can see rendering of this project prepared by Fangor. The, this was just like a paint, picture, uh, uh, which you can actually go to the Warsaw Fine Arts Academy and see it's still, uh, it's still, here, it's still there. So you can see this is a swimming pool uh, this is a sport uh, um, stadium, and here there is a huge hill and a tennis stadium as well. So here is the uh, yeah. Here is a plan of the whole uh, of the whole uh, settlement, 
and uh, also some sketches with the views of the swimming pool, which this swimming pool was never never realized. After all, they realized different different project, but it's not really not really interesting. It's very uh, very nice the, this uh, project with this wall with holes inside. It's very modern and still also very you know it could be done like two years ago or something. Another views views on the swimming pool, and here is realization. So <coughs> what they decided to focus about is they decided to not very use architectural uh, tools, but more to work with the earth, with the earth and with the ground. So to build the stadium, they decided to dig a hole inside the uh, inside the ground and then what they dig out they put it and they shape it into this uh, shape it into this uh, into this hill and where the, when they were designing this uh, system of uh, open air uh, swimming pools they were doing actually the same using this uh, the hill to put swimming pools inside and they were like thinking about how sun is affecting those swimming pools so people are, could actually take the best from from this uh, natural uh, circumstances uh, uh, around uh, around them and uh, also, when they were designing the stadium, they were thinking about not only what people could actually see on the stadium, but they were thinking about broader context, what they can see 20 meters in front of them, what they can see two kilometers in front of them, and about the Vistula River, which was also visible and was very important part of the whole project. And this is emphasized by Sultan as a leading person uh, leading person in the team. So here you can see few uh, archival uh, photographs from 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 the site. Actually, right now it's completely devastated and completely destroyed. There is an interview made with uh, with Sultan in the 90s when one one of the uh, art historians from uh, from Warsaw went to visit him uh, in United States because after he was kind of kicked out from Poland uh, because of what he was thinking and he became the main chef of uh, uh, architecture department at the Harvard University and after years there was this art historian who went to see him and he was showing him documentation of those projects and Sultan actually started to cry when he when he saw it because he was like very, you know, deeply connected with those, with those, with those projects. Here you can see the facilities of the tennis, uh, tennis center and some views for the details, architectural details, which shows you how actually they were thinking about the, si uh, about the sun and uh, the shades were also, uh, also, also designed. Yeah, okay, so thank you for your attention.